for uh, thank you for coming out. Um, we've got a really interesting panel tonight on a very kind of complex network of issues, um, looking at questions of, of gun violence, but also how gun violence affects the political and journalistic climate when it comes to mass shootings um, versus um, the um, uh, the reality of uh, gun violence in many communities, and especially looking at the impact on uh, African-American communities. So each speaker kind of comes from a different part of this debate, um, and I think will bring a very interesting perspective um, uh, to our conversation. Um, Jamie Fox, uh, Professor James Fox, uh, is a professor here at Northeastern in the uh, School of Criminal Justice. Um, he's probably one of the best known, probably the best known authority on mass shootings, their roots and their causes. Um, he's written more than a dozen books. Um, he's a, 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 an opinion contributing writer for USA Today and is uh, leading a massive study um, with the Associated Press in Northeastern um, looking at mass shootings. And a number of his findings um, are quite illuminating. They actually often go against the conventional wisdom. And he'll be starting us off with about a 20-minute kind of presentation uh, discussing what he's found and both the kind of political and journalistic um, response to these mass shootings and how they may shape uh, the debate for, for, good, uh, for, for good or ill. Um, Sarah Peck is a former U.S. diplomat um, who dealt with um, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iraq, um, and then came into a new conflict zone uh, back here in the U.S. Um, looking at guns. Um, she's the head of a, gr a group called United on Guns um, and works closely with uh, some of the faculty in the law school um, from a public health perspective as well uh, about the impact of gun violence um, and how to address it. Um, Charles Scott Wallace, Wallace Thomas, my apologies. Charles Wallace Thomas IV um, is a student here at Northeastern. Uh, he majors in economics and math. Um, he's also the head of SED, which is Students Against uh, uh, Institutional Discrimination, which is one of the most effective uh, student groups on campus uh, in terms of raising questions about um, uh, treatment of students of color on campus, uh, some of which occasionally involve uh, the police. Um, but in his, in his non-campus life, is very interested in questions of economic development in communities of color uh, and some of the other challenges that communities of color face uh, in Boston and elsewhere. Um, so as I said, they, they come at this from kind of different perspectives, but I think this is an issue, uh, guns, crimes, mass incarceration, that sometimes gets kind of knotted up and, and people think they have one answer without thinking of some of the consequences. So we're going to talk about that tonight. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to start with Professor Fox uh, giving us kind of a background briefing on this issue. And then uh, Professor Ted Landsmark uh, and I will come to the front and then lead a panel discussion. Um, Sarah and Charles, if you want to sit in the front row and watch, it might be a little easier. That's where I'm going to go. OK, first to see, if, can, you, can you all hear me back there? Great. What's that? I couldn't. Yeah, hear. Okay, great. Uh, and uh, is there a clicker? I'll just use this or, or this. Yep. All right. Well, I am talking about mass shootings, um, which really is a centerpiece of a lot of the discussion about gun violence in the last few years. I'm also going to be focusing on journalism too, since I know that this is in part a journalism course. So now I've been studying mass shootings for an awful long time. In fact, uh, I'm not trying to sell that book because it's way out of print. But that was that we published that book uh, 28 years ago, which is um, I'm sorry, I do that. I should do my, the math quickly. Uh, 34 years ago. I'm sorry, 34 years ago, and literally half of my life. So I, as you can see, I look a lot younger then. Uh, and back then. It was about, the book was about mass killing and serial killing. Everybody wanted to talk about serial killing. No one wanted to talk about mass, mass killing. It was a boring topic for most people. But I frequently get the question today, well, what's so different? You know, we never heard about this stuff before. Why is we have mass shootings now, but we didn't have them before? Well, we did. 
for example, back in the 1980s, we had some major mass shootings. We had the postal shootings, one in, in Oklahoma, 14, met, met 14 postal workers killed. That's where the term going postal came from. We had, uh, we had uh, shootings in, in restaurants, 23 people killed at a Luby's cafeteria. We had, a, we had a shooting at uh, an elementary school. You know, when Sandy Hook happened, people said, imagine an elementary school. Yeah, we can understand maybe high school students, but killing elementary schools. Well, that happened again back in the, or in the 1980s. Then we had uh, the McDonald's massacre, which uh, the Boston Herald called the Big Mac attack. Um, so we did have them. But no one really paid much attention. I was very concerned about it. Until 2012. You know, they say bad things happen in threes, and there were three really bad things that year. A few others, too. We had uh, the shooting at, uh, at Oikos University in the West Coast uh, near San Francisco. We had the shooting at the movie theater in Aurora, Colorado, and, of course, Sandy Hook in December of 2012, which the Associated Press, uh, in its annual um, survey of editors, determined that was the number one story of the year, Sandy Hook. It beat out the presidential election when we had 17 Republicans uh, trying to buy for presidency. It also beat out the, that other Sandy, uh, Superstorm Sandy, the hurricane, which actually killed many more people than the Sandy Hook shooting. But of course, this, the storm, uh, their victims were mainly elderly people, no children. Sandy Hook, of course, claimed the lives of 20 children, and that certainly hit right at the heart of America. So that really began an era where we started really paying attention about mass shootings. Uh, this is a graph I did from Google Trends, <coughs> excuse me, which um, allows you to see what are people what are people searching on Google. Well, the red is uh, mass shootings. And the blue is homicide, and mass shootings starting around 2012 started to soar, overtaking the extent to which people search the term homicide, which is a much bigger problem, by the way, homicide. Uh, and then scholars, academics, very few articles were being published about mass shootings those days. Uh, this is a Google Scholar. But starting in 2012, everybody now uh, is writing about it, and many people call themselves experts who really shouldn't be calling themselves experts. But that's, that's another thing. Um, the prevailing view out there is that there's an epidemic. Uh, we hear that term a lot. I mean, it was not just on the, the Morning Joe, where they declared uh, uh, that we're in the midst of an epidemic of mass shootings. Uh, Mother Jones talked about an epidemic, the news, news organization. Uh, and uh, Peter O'Rourke, one of the presidential candidates, uh, referred to mass shootings as an epidemic. The question, is it really an epidemic? People think it is. Um, well, I'm going to basically show you that it isn't. But what it, where there is an epidemic is in terms of fear. Uh, the extent to which people are afraid of mass shootings has grown precipitously. This is the Chapman University Index of Fear. And then the most recent surveys in uh, August, a survey uh, from USA Today uh, basically showed that 21% uh, of Americans avoid certain public places because they're afraid of being shot and killed. 21%. Uh, and uh, a poll in September, uh, Washington Post AP poll, showed that uh, as many as 6 in 10 Americans uh, fear that there will be a mass shooting in their neighborhood. So fear is definitely rampant, and lots of people think there's an epidemic. It's gotten so bad <laughs> that we are hypervigilant. Uh, we scare very easily. Uh, last year, you may remember this, the Simmons College it was put on lockdown because there was a fear that there was an active shooter. Uh, and a lot of the institutions and hospitals in the immediate area were also put on lockdown because of this mass, this active shooter on campus. It turned out to be a balloon. Someone was having a birthday, and the balloon popped, and someone saw, said, active shooter. That happened actually last uh, month, uh, the earliest month, as you may know, in, in Boca Raton. Same thing, balloon pop, people started running. Most interesting example is this one. Uh, this is the uh, fireworks, July 4th fireworks in um, Myrtle Beach. I don't know if you can hear it. There's the fireworks. Then someone started saying, active shooter. And everybody runs. Thousands of people fled the fireworks display thinking there was an active shooter. There wasn't. 
So let me talk about what the data really show. What are the facts as opposed to the fear? And I'm going to show some statistics here. I know an overdose of statistics is like math murder, so bear with me a little bit on these numbers. Uh, as Jonathan mentioned, I work with the Associated Press USA Today and me at Northeastern at a uh, comprehensive database of mass killing. And these are the facts. These are all the cases. In blue are mass killings, four or more people killed, not just by gunfire, about almost 20% of mass killings involve other weapons. The green are mass shootings of four or more people killed. Most of those, by the way, are family annihilations, like the one we had in Abington a couple of weeks ago. Half of mass, kill mass shootings are in the family. But the ones that people really are uh, dread, the scariest are also the rarest, are the public mass shootings in red there. You know, we tend to have about six or seven a year. It's been somewhat of an uptick till about 11 last year. And I know 11 is more than seven, but it's, it's four more than seven. And uh, out of a, co a population of 320 million people, four more people went on a public shooting rampage. I'm not sure you can call that an epidemic. And there have been other times, by the way, going back earlier years, where there have been spikes. And everybody declared that, that it was an epidemic. And then the following year was better. So, you know, what goes up must come down. So that's the reality. Now, it's true that some of the largest ones have happened in recent years. These are all the mass shootings where at least 20 people were killed. Massive level of carnage. And as you can see, uh, six of the eight have occurred in the past dozen years. So we did have, you know, we had the McDonald's massacre and the Luby's cafeteria, but most of them happened more recently, which says a lot of thing about uh, things like um, high capacity magazines. And by the way, it doesn't have to be a rifle. Uh, two of these, including the Virginia Tech shooting, were handguns, semi-automatic handguns, but equipped with a large capacity magazine. So why is this disconnect between fact and fear? Well, three reasons I'm gonna go through. One is that there's some flawed data sets out there that get a lot of attention. Two is mass confusion about mass shooting. What is it? What's the definition? And then finally, uh, a lot about the nature of the media coverage. You know, I, I, like this, um, this one uh, presentation on, uh, on CNN where the host basically said that it's unbelievable, hard to believe that we don't have an epidemic and that the numbers aren't rising. Well, it's true. It may be hard to believe, but it is true. So, one of the most widely circulated databases and graphs is Mother Jones. Got the uh, uh, seal of approval of, of, of 538, prominent uh, website. And they have, and uh, Mark Foreman and folks at uh, Mother Jones talk about an epidemic. Is look at that rise in the number of people killed in mass shootings. How can you not say that this, that's a, a surge? Well, there's some reasons for that. One is they have a lot of missing data. It's hard to find those cases retroactively. Way back in the 80s, a lot of missing data. In the 90s, somewhat less. And actually, if you add in all the cases they overlooked, that kind of flattens out. But also, even in recent years, they show this pattern of increase in the number of incidents of mass killings, public mass killings. Well, if you look really closely at their website, in the small print, you'll see that they changed their definition in 2013 from four more people killed to three more people killed. <laughs> but you have to look really closely, and most people don't. If you take away the instances with three people killed, there hasn't been an increase. Now, you know, after, um, after the Pulse shooting in Orlando, uh, Time Magazine called me. They wanted uh, to know if I had data, trend data, on mass killings. So I gave them some charts uh, to go along with their coverage of the Orlando Pulse shooting. And they published it, and it basically showed that there was no increase. I gave them a, a chart going all the way back to the early, to the mid 1970s. And then a year later, when the Las Vegas shooting happened, 
they called me back and said, do you have an updated chart? And I said, yeah, and I sent them this chart, which basically shows, yeah, the little, the somewhat of increase in the orange, which is the, which is the number of victims killed, but not really an increase in the red, which is the number of mass killings. And they called me back and they said, you know, well, what about this Mother Jones data? And so I told them that they have a lot of missing data and we've, in, we've sent them the cases they've missed, but they didn't put them in. And I also told them about the fact that they changed their definition. And then they called me back a couple of days later and said, just we'll let you know that the editors decide to use the Mother Jones data. And I said, why? So it's because it shows an increase. It fit the, <laughs> the storyline, that the narrative that they want to portray, that mass killings are on the rise, mass shootings are the rise. Uh, another area is this idea of, a, of an active shooter. It's a relatively new term. It was coined after Columbine in 1999. Well, it didn't show up in the media until 2006, and then greatly after in 2007 with the uh, Virginia Tech shooting. Now, the FBI did this study retrospectively. They, they went back and looked at cases of active shooters, which an active shooter, you, you see, is someone who picks up a gun and wants to kill lots of people in a public place. Doesn't mean they succeed. That's their intent. And they went back, and there's the trend. Now, one, thing, one problem is, and they, they do say that an active shooter is not a mass shooter. But all the examples they give in their press release, except for one, the uh, Holocaust Memorial, are mass killings. That's why uh, the New York Times and CNN and other news organizations wrote that mass killings have tripled. Uh, the Attorney General said mass shootings have tripled. No, active shootings have tripled. Not the same thing. Now, let me say that, I, that I'm not so sure they've tripled. They claim that there's only one instance in the year 2000 of an active shooter, which was, by the way, Michael McDermott in Wakefield, Massachusetts, uh, Edgewater Technology mass shooting. Uh, I don't believe that in a country then of about 280 million people, there was not a, a single American who picked up a gun and wanted to kill lots of people but didn't succeed. I don't think so. It's just hard to find those cases when you go back in time. And to prove that, I compared the last four years of their data set, which were collected concurrently, to the first four years of the data set, which were collected by going back into news reports. It's very hard to find in news reports going way back instances where people don't die. And to prove my point, uh, in the uh, sorry, five, in the last five years uh, of their data collected retro, retro uh, concurrently, 37 percent of mass of active shooters killed no one. If you go back to the first five years of the data set, which they collected retrospectively through open source news searches, uh, almost 8% killed no one. Boy, what an increase. So either active shooters of today are lousy shots, not like the old days, bad old days, or they just didn't find all these instances of, killer, of, of those who wanted to kill lots of people but didn't manage to do it, didn't succeed. They missed a lot of cases. For example, three people shot and killed at the University of Arizona, uh, five people shot and killed in Pittsburgh. So, then we have this big confusion about um, this, the gun violence archive. Starting in 2013, the gun violence archive and the mass shooting tracker said, well, wait a minute, you, the mass shooting has been defined as four or more people killed by gunfire. But why does it? Why do they have to die? A mass shooting doesn't have doesn't say anything about death. So they define mass shootings as former people killed or injured, and they've started collecting data prospectively. Thank, thank you, on instances of former people shot. Now it's great that they're doing that. It's a wonderful data source. But. The problem is it's confused with mass killings because they always talk about those data in the aftermath of a large-scale mass killing. 
I mean, and look, look at this like CBS News. There have been uh, more mass shootings this year than, than days. That was uh, back in August. And that's true. Four more people shot? Yes, there were more, just more than, there was slightly more than the number of days. But then they follow it with examples of mass killings with lots and lots of people dying. The problem is that people talk about hundreds of mass shootings a year, but the only examples they give are mass killings. And one of the Americans are scared, thinking people are dying left and right. In fact, uh, about half of their mass shootings, no one dies, thankfully. And 28%, one person's killed. So about three quarters is either a single victim murder or no murder at all. Only 8% uh, qualify as the traditional definition of mass shootings. In fact, on average, 1.1 individuals are killed in these cases. Most, like we have, like today, three people killed, I think it's 12, or nine, nine injured, three people killed in Long Beach. So these things do happen, but let's not confuse them with mass killings. The other issue is this idea with the media coverage. You know, seeing is believing, and people see on TV coverage that makes them believe that mass killings are rampant. You know, back when we had the shooting, for example, in 18, 1989 at an elementary school in Stockton, California, with a bunch of elementary school killed, kids killed that no one remembers, we didn't have all these cable news channels. CNN was just at its infancy, didn't have a large uh, viewership back then. And then they have all these satellite trucks that could get on a crime scene almost within minutes. So when Sandy Hook happened, because of technology, they were able to beam images of children being let out of their school with tears still fresh in their eyes, right into your living room television set in high definition. It certainly has an impact. Back years ago, when a mass shooting happened, mass killing, they would, they would have a little bulletin. Uh, you know, 20 people die, you know, film at 11. And that was it, because they really couldn't, they couldn't show anything. So they didn't. The example is the Virginia Tech shooting. I remember that day very well. It was, it's Marathon Monday in Boston. In fact, I ran the marathon that day. Uh, and I, I don't look the type, but yeah, I, I run the width of it, you know. Most people do the length. I run across Beacon Street. And, go get some spaghetti. You have to avoid all the runners though. That's tough, so it takes some agility. I got, came home, turned the TV set, and as the death toll ro rose, the anchors were giddy. Oh, now it's the, you know, nine killed. Oh, it's 12 killed. Oh, now it's 20. Now it's the largest school shooting of all time. Oh, now the death toll's higher. Now it's the largest shooting of, of, of any kind. They were so excited. Um, you think we get this obsessed with records. It's got to be the deadliest, the worst, the bloodiest. As if it, would, as if it would, wouldn't matter if it wasn't the worst. Uh, you know, the, when the Texas shooting, Santa Fe, Texas shooting happened in uh, May of 2018, the headline was the deadliest school shooting since Parkland. It was only three months earlier. In fact, it was the only school shooting with a death since Parkland. When Aurora, Colorado theater happened, the largest since Columbine, somehow they got to find that it's the largest, it's the worst. Unfortunately, records are there to be broken. And it does tend to challenge someone to out, outdo the hero. Like uh, Adam Lanza, the shooter from, uh, from Sandy Hook, who was trying to outdo Adam uh, uh, Anders Breivik, the Norway shooter who killed 77. He didn't come close, but he tried. Then there's the issue about these are unspeakable crimes, so really should the killers be unspeakable? Should we not talk about them at all? It was really unfortunate when the, when the, when the uh, New York Times decided to put the Virginia Tech shooter on the front page above the fold in the paper whose, whose slogan is, all the news is fit to print. So I guess they felt this was fitting to give this kind of attention. I wouldn't be bothered if they just had a headshot of him. But you have to show him brandishing guns? No. 
So now we have this, this whole movement, this no notoriety movement. In fact, 146 criminologists did an open letter to the media urging them never to mention a killer, a mass killer, mass shooter, and don't show his picture. I, I refuse to sign that. I think it's kind of absurd that we can't actually, it's fact, it's news. So if you kill four, you can't be named, but if you kill three, you can. What about serial killers? We, we make movies about them. How about sex offenders? Should we not mention them? We do, we put them in sex offender registries with their picture. So it's not really a, necessary, but the, the big thing these days is to not mention them. The prime minister of, uh, of uh, New Zealand after the, after the shooting in which 51 Muslims were killed, so we're not gonna mention the guy's name. It doesn't matter. What like-minded people applaud is the act, not the actor. What white supremacists enjoy was the fact that 51 Muslims were murdered. Doesn't matter what the guy's name at all, doesn't matter what his face is, it's what he did. So, what are we, not, not reported at all? Now there is a point where we go too far. We go, where we go from news reporting to celebrity watch. The Las Vegas shooter, uh, under this notion that we will get to learn everything we can to um, understand why he did it, which we never did find out the motive. We know what casino games he likes. We, heard, we know about his interest in karaoke. We know um, what he ate for dinner. That was the New York Times said what he ate. Uh, we even know what shoe size he wore, and that he, there was this picture of him on his high school tennis team, as if that's like a red flag, warning sign. Look out for people who have high school tennis teams. Now, all this does is to make someone larger than life. I, you know, I got into this real battle on CNN with hosts. I didn't mean for the, for the, for to go so negatively after a while, but he got very defensive as I pointed this thing out, that let's, let's not talk about so much of the fluff. The facts, yes, the important biographical information about the killer, yes, but not what he liked to eat. And let, by the way, let's also get rid of this, this word, use of the word manifesto. A manifesto, if you look it up, is a policy statement by someone of prominence, it's not a mass killer. The one smart thing that the shooter from, from um, Dylan Roof, the shooter from Charleston has said is, I stop calling my rants our writings, a manifesto. It's not that, and I agree. We should be focusing less on pain, less on suffering, because that plays right into the mindset of killers who watch the coverage, and they'd love to see something similar at their neighborhood as long as they're doing it. They love seeing people uh, scared, running, running from a crime scene, crying, hiding. We should focus on resilience, strength, like the stories about uh, citizens in El Paso who lined up to give blood. That's a good story. It basically says that the killer didn't win. Um, really, my time is running low, so let me try to talk a little bit about what we should do. We, there are a lot of things we should do, but we should do it for the right reason. Oftentimes, we do it for the wrong reason. Oh, I should point this out. I did a uh, podcast a few weeks ago uh, uh, on Reason.com. I, I was very pleased with it, and, and the uh, person who did the interview pulled out one sentence of mine, which was that there's no evidence that there's an epidemic of mass shootings, and he tweeted it. And then uh, President Trump tweeted, retweeted it, which was a pro real problem for me. I, I had thousands and thousands of tweets. Uh, my fellow liberals condemned me, uh, gun owners, uh, praise me. Um, the fact that it's not an epidemic doesn't mean that it's not a problem. It is a problem, and there are things we should do. Unfortunately, that message, the factual statement, was, has been misused by him, also by the NRA, who frequently has been quoting this line from my, of mine. At least they say I'm a gun control proponent. That maybe gives them me more credibility in their eyes, I guess. We need to do something about it. Now, there are many proposals out there, many, many proposals, good ideas about gun control. 
and we'll be talking about them, and I don't want to steal the thunder of the other speakers here. Uh, but let me say this, that the very, the very crime that gets people most excited and motivated to, to pass legislation, gun control legislation, that is mass shootings, uh, this is a very kind of crime that's least impacted by, ma by those gun legislation. Math, for example, universal background checks. Math killers, most of them do not have criminal records and they have not been institutionalized. Most of them actually buy their weapons legally uh, and pass background checks. Uh, things like raising the age from 18 to 21, good idea. But there's only been five mass killers who are 18, 19, 20 years old who have used a rifle uh, in, killing, in, in committing a mass shooting. And, and of those five, two of them got them from, a parent, from their parents. One was a deputy sheriff and had access to all sorts of guns. Two bought their guns on retail. Now, if, if the age for buying a rifle was 21, like it is for handguns, that doesn't mean they wouldn't get one. The thing about mass killers is they're very determined individuals. They will find a way, no matter what hurdles we put in their path. We should put those hurdles, but don't expect it to solve our mass shooting problem. Mass shootings are only about 1% of the homicides in this country. That's, it's the other 99% where we can make the greatest inroads in a lot of these proposals. Uh, the assault weapons ban so often is frequently say, well, let's, that, that, we shouldn't have let it die. Well, I agree, we shouldn't have. But let's also understand that there was no impact on mass shootings of the 10-year assault weapons ban that was in place from 1994 to 2004. Most mass shooters, mass killers, use semi-automatic handguns. They're easier to hide. They do use large capacity magazines. That's what we should focus our efforts on, certainly. Concealed carry on campus. Um, I only about three more minutes, okay? You know, the other approach, instead of uh, res more restrictions, lots of folks want less restrictions. After Virginia Tech, there's grassroots movement around the country to allow students and faculty who have permits to have their guns on campus. Back then, in 2007, only one state, Utah, allowed unrestricted carrying of guns on college campuses. Well, since that time, they have actually been kind of successful. More and more states are allowing uh, anyone who has a, a license to have their gun on a college campus. Bad idea, bad idea. I mean, one thing, yeah, you know, with the extent of drinking on campus and suicide ideation on campus, last thing we need to have is guns in the mix. Plus, you have a guy with a gun, in a backpack and blue jeans, the offender, and all these other people with guns and backpacks and blue jeans, how are they going to tell who's actually the killer and who are the people responding to the killing? It could certainly be a wild shootout on a college campus. Uh, not a good idea. Uh, let me say one thing about mental health. I agree with expanding mental health treatment, even though most mass killers are not mentally ill, they're angry, they're maybe depressed, they don't hear voices. The thing about mass killers is they externalize blame. They see, they see themselves as victims of injustice. And you offer them expanded treatment, they say, hell no, I don't want your treatment. Actually, what I want is fair treatment, not psychological treatment. And so when, when Obama went to Hartford, Hartford to give a speech after Sandy Hook, that we need to we need to do something about health and mentally ill before it's too late. Why? Is it because we're so concerned about the well-being of the mentally ill? Or is it because we're concerned about the well-being of the people they may shoot? It's really the latter. I think we should talk about mental health issues on days when there weren't mass shootings. On some random Tuesday, not in the aftermath of mass killing, which only intensifies the stigma associated with being mentally ill by fusing it together with mass killing. Uh, yeah, it is. Uh, we could virtually eliminate mass shootings and mass killings in our country. If I don't think we will. 
People often talk about, you know, point to uh, uh, Australia, which passed very strict gun control legislation after a large-scale mass uh, killing back in 1996. And after, since then, they've only had one. People say, we need to be like Australia. Well, I'm not sure that's going to happen. You know, we have far more, many, many more guns than Australia, and we, and we have a Second Amendment, which they don't have. Now, if we wanted to stop mass shooting, yeah, I guess we could. We could go around and collect all the guns. You know, Beto O'Rourke has talked about that. We'd go around and arrest everybody who scares us, all the people who even dream about mass shootings. Lock them all up. I don't know where we'll put them. Uh, everyone who... Say, anybody who plays violent video games too much or lock them up too? Anybody who wears all those dark clothing or black clothing or listens to, to, to music, a certain kind of music, and watches too much violent television, lock them up too because they could be dangerous, according to people who believe that these are warning signs. Well, the thing is, we're not going to do that because we value our personal freedoms. And unfortunately, mass killings, which are rare, the price that we pay, one of the prices that we pay for those freedoms. So I, I uh, thank you for your time and patience with my going over by a few minutes. Uh, I'll certainly be available after, later on for questions. And I hope I didn't go too fast, but I will I, Okay, I will. And I'll turn this off. Why don't you sit there? Oh, yeah. And I'll get rid of this. Um... So we'll have a chance to kind of talk to, to Jamie more um, about both what you say and what, how what you say is used, which I think is, is, is an interesting issue. But let me turn to Sarah, because in a way, you're in a way new to this. You were overseas. Um, you were involved in foreign policy. You came back uh, to this country, left diplomacy. Why get involved in gun control? But also, what was your take kind of landing in this world that, that Jamie describes or, or that you saw um, that, that made you kind of go in this direction? And, uh, and, and what did you think you could do? Hi. Well, I, uh, I saw from my perspective in serving, as you mentioned, in Afghanistan and in uh, Erbil, Iraq, 30 miles from the Islamic State, what it's like to be in a conflict zone. Actually, it feels a little bit more safe, in a funny way, in a conflict zone, because unless something is actually happening, it's pretty calm in a conflict zone. Um, and I just could not understand how my country could not deal with this problem. And so when I decided to leave the State Department, um, I, I arrived here and uh, uh, retired on May of uh, 2019. And I turned immediately to my law school, Northeastern, yay, and uh, uh, went over to something called the Public Health Advocacy Institute, which has pioneered the uh, tobacco litigation. And I thought as a former litigator, you know, isn't there something that we can do from a public policy perspective and maybe from a lawsuit perspective, that could make a difference. And what we decided to do was to, to try to, uh, you know, you, you, you all know in this room, the politics are polarized. It, we're, we're not moving anywhere fast on these legislative approaches that were just discussed. I'll, I'll go into more detail. Um, but, but surely there's common ground where Americans we all love our children. We all want a safe community. We just see guns slightly differently, and we see the solution to the problem slightly differently. And so what United on Guns is intended to do is try to unite experts from multiple disciplines to try to come up with new approaches, not necessarily legislative approaches, um, and also even more importantly, to unite Americans. It's just gotten to the point where you can't even talk to each other without you know, resorting to the, the, the slogans rather than the facts and rather than solutions. So that was our idea. Um, I'm an example of a person who just says, we'll have to do something. So we're doing something. 
And the first something that we're doing is uh, we've, uh, we've enlisted the first year law class and uh, in partnership with uh, Stop Handgun Violence here in Boston, research red flag laws, also known as extreme risk protective order laws. Uh, and the idea is that if, if this seems to be a common ground area, this is, an, this is a kind of law that conservatives and progressives alike tend to favor in 18 states and Washington, D.C. Can, can you describe what the law does, what a red flag sure. law does? So unlike a, uh, a background check, uh, which Professor Fox uh, identified as you know, a kind of broad and, and isn't focused at all, really, uh, and it's, this red flag law is a tool that can be used by in the state that has it, either by family members or by law enforcement officials to go before a judge and describe disturbing uh, behavior on the part of a loved one or a or a known person, and if you if you meet the requirements, and of course it varies state by state, but it's fairly similar across the board, different legal standards, but fairly similar. Uh, then, and this can be on an ex parte basis, a weapon theoretically can be removed until the owner can appear in court with or without an attorney to make the case that they should keep their weapon. And uh, Florida, for example, passed such a law after the Parkland shooting. And I just saw an interesting article reported in the Tampa Bay News. Um, over 2,600, now this has been, what, a year, 2,600 uh, uh, orders have been issued and this article lays out some of the people who, uh, who received an order and, and relinquished their weapons. Interestingly, half of the people voluntarily relinquished their we weapons because I suppose they, they understood they were in crisis. This is a tool and it's got bipartisan support. So this is an area where we'd like to, this, this uh, initiative, we'd like to help states who want this law to move forward and implement it well, because there are many challenges. Imagine you're a, a partner of your woman, let's say, and your partner or husband is, in, is angry, threatening you, has a weapon. You go and you get this order, and the police show up on the front door to remove the weapon. Um, guess what? The police may be shot at, or you may be shot at. This is a dangerous situation with a person, according to a judge, who is in crisis. So this just takes me back to the issue that, you know, all of this is very complex, but it is a law that has possibility. And in fact, I want to stop here just to say uh, one of the things I gave some thought about when I knew I was coming tonight was to think about what could change in our, our federal politics that might make some difference, that, that, may, that may result in some kind of, of reform in this election cycle. You know, we have uh, President Trump, who's, who's got other things on his mind at the moment, um, but he has said that he would consider passing a red flag law. And Mitch McConnell, who also has other things on his mind, um, has said if the president would back this, would support this, we would bring these, these, these uh, bills that have been passed by the House uh, to the Senate floor and we would take a vote. Um, and so I think it's, it's an interesting question. Is, is, is this the sort of thing that could actually, uh, from, a, from a, a, a political perspective, might be something that Trump President Trump would consider passing, maybe just to deflect attention from other things going on. I mean, it, it could really provide cover for Republicans who, who fear supporting any law like this, um, and, and it could be a real win for the Republican Party, as well as for all of us, if, if it were properly implemented. And one other thing about the proposed federal law is that it is it would simply be an incentive for states to pass their own law. It would provide funding and, um, and uh, capacity building for training of judges and police. I mean, it's a complicated thing to implement such a law. So it still leaves 
the decision of whether or not to pass such a law in the, in the hands of the state. So this is an example of what we're trying to do, trying to find common ground, and uh, and I'm going to leave it there. Uh, yeah, you know, and we'll come we'll come back. So uh, Charles, let, let me ask you. Uh, the debate has been, you know, discussion of, of mass shootings and mass killings, and then about gun control. Is what does that feel like for you? Does it feel too narrow? Are there other issues that should be part of the discussion? Um, you kind of what's your sense of that? Hello. Okay. Hi. Um, Yes, um, I want to take a moment first. For I want to take a moment to zoom out a little bit. This is already a, a broad, wide-ranging issue, but uh, I want to zoom out just a bit. Um, whereas it might not be statistically significant, or it might not be statistically the case that mass shootings or mass killings are an epidemic, um, certainly I think when we look at um, a lot of what's happening in the United States and across the world, uh, we can consider the the notion of Americanized and racialized capitalism and its effects as an epidemic. Um, and this, this is for a multitude of reasons, which we could get into about uh, specific economic structures which perpetuate specific uh, dynamics between um, communities. And you could think of one community being people who possess a lot of wealth and one community being people who don't. Um, but speaking racially, very specifically for a moment, and we look at the history of American capitalism. Um, the 1619 Project came out in the New York Times not too long ago, and it was an excellent piece of journalism on uh, sort of the origins of the slave trade in the Americas um, and how that was sort of the, the mechanism through which primitive accumulation was able to happen where people who owned capital, which were people at the time, uh, slaves, were able to accumulate a bunch of wealth and design institutions to further their interests, namely the continued containment and exploitation of that labor um, uh, and so that they could continue to profit um, over time. And those institutions were built into the very fabric of our nation. Um, you know, it took a constitutional amendment to make sure that people were free, except in the cases where they become imprisoned, um, uh, free meaning not able to be um, enslaved and made to work for no profit. Um, so I think, just generally speaking, capitalism is what we should be talking about, because it is, the pred it is what predicates so much of um, the mass fear or separation, disintegration of us from ourselves, because it re necess necessitates um, competition and all sorts of other things that um, are counter to motives for, or counter motives for um, pro-sociality, so they're not motives for pro-sociality. Um, so w under capitalism, or uh, something that emerged from capitalism is the notion of American, or of the American style of policing, um, specifically for, for black um, African, or African Americans um, who were slaves. Uh, law enforcement, um, by and large, was meant to ensure that the economic interests of capital owners um, were protected. So private property, um, namely private property being people and private property being sort of land. Uh, so American police, in part, were birthed out of a, ne a necessity to contain black and brown bodies. Um, and this hasn't really changed. Uh, I spent a lot of time in, in Roxbury, uh, which is a neighborhood not too far away from here. Um, and in, in fact, used to be uh, some of the area that we're, that we're in now. Um, and I, almost invariably, there are squad cars um, in groups of two or three with lights going on uh, and where there's not sort of an active emergent situation. Um, folks are being surveilled, uh, people are being watched. Um, there are schools uh, are built sort of in the architectural styles um, that don't seem to be built to foster learning and, and growth, but rather containment. They kind of look like prisons. Um, and I wonder what effect that has on the consciousness of a child who sees incidents of, of police violence, which we should also take a, take a second to acknowledge that police violence is gun violence too. So when we're having these debates about gun violence and gun control and whether or not it's necessary to institute background checks, we should also be considering um, the folks that we are uh, ostensibly uh, enrolling and serve in, in um, institutions that are meant to serve and protect us, um, whether or not we should be applying some of these, these same thoughts and debates um, to those institutions. Um, but sort of people exist in these spaces and are reminded of um, incidents of, of police killings like Sandra Bland and Philando Castile and Michael Brown and Eric Garner and so many others. Um, and when you look at what causes um, deviance, uh, part of it is whether or not it's normalized, whether or not deviating from the norm is, is or in committing a crime is normalized. And when you're put in an environment where you're surveilled or where your schools look like prisons or where you're criminalized just by existing, 
um, it, it almost makes sense that we see um, higher rates of, of gun violence in a lot of these inner city um, communities. So that's, that's kind of a yeah. broad ranging thing. But, 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 but let, me, let me pick up on that because, Jamie, one of the things you talked about is that there's not an epidemic of mass shooting, there's an epidemic of fear. And I wonder, you know, as you say, you call yourself a liberal, you say you support gun, gun control, and yet President Trump and the NRA have seized comments that you've made. What about that connection? Does the, does the, the climate of fear then create responses that actually either, A, make the problem worse, or make other problems worse, where people start to say, we've got to crack down more, we need, you know, more surveillance? Let me be clear about one thing, too, be first, about this idea about doing the right thing for the wrong reason. The right reason for gun control are all those shootings that happen not in mass killings. Uh, you know, 31 people were killed that one weekend between Dayton and El Paso. That's the exact average number who are killed by guns in a homicide daily in America. Of course, they're not all killed at once or in one place, but 31 are killed every day. That's where we can have some uh, impact. Yet yeah, the problem too, as you indicate, is we, in our hypervigilance and fear, we often do the wrong thing. We see this particularly in schools, and not, not just making schools like fortresses, which they are, but uh, forcing kids to go through active shooter drills, which are awful, particularly the ones that are designed to be realistic with fake blood and, and guns, and in uh, some schools don't announce them uh, surprise kids with them in one school, but on the loudspeaker say, this is not a drill, it's a real thing. Well, it was a drill. They just wanted people to be treated like it was a real thing. Uh, this is very traumatizing for kids. When you think about the risk, by the way, another stat, 6.7 students are killed each year on average by gunfire at school, 6.7. That includes in 2018, they had Parkland and Santa Fe, 6.7. 30 students a year, on average, are killed traveling to and from school in bicycle accidents or on foot in a, in a school bus or a, or a private car. Five times as many. Yet, only half the states have a bicycle helmet law. Now, if we want to protect kids, we should, have a, we should have a federal bicycle helmet law for children. But so we make we we send we, we are scaring kids. We send them the message that oh the bad guy is out to get you. We wouldn't be surrounding you with metal detectors and cameras and having make you go through these drills if you weren't in danger. And then we do bad and stupid things like putting locks on the inside of classroom doors. Uh, traditionally, school doors were not locked. Now they want to lock them so that they can keep the active shooter out. Well. The most likely thing to happen if a classroom has a lock on the inside is that some 18-year-old boy is going to push a 16-year-old girl inside an empty classroom, lock the door, sexually assault her, and while she's screaming for help, no one can find the key. So we do bad and brought the wrong things out of fear. But I do wonder, you know, after, I guess I think a lot about terrorism and the response to terrorism. So in the, in the after 9-11, there were a series of rules and laws passed, which led to greater surveillance, um, profiling, all sorts of things, which it turned out, of course, many in the Republican Party had been waiting for a chance to use them. And, and I'm just wondering, picking up a little bit on what Charles said, I mean, is there a feeling that this, epi this, this fear of an epidemic of mass shootings could lead not just to things that are not effective against mass shooters, but could lead to a willingness to not to suspend some of those liberties, to go further than that, to say, no, we need more surveillance, we need to empower the police more, you know, that, that kind of approach. You know, don't worry about body cameras, police have to have more freedom of action, stop and frisk, all these things that often have a disproportionate impact on African American communities. Well, the White House wants to monitor uh, social media uh, people's phones, people's watches, because uh, they, they believe that they can spot the shooters before they strike, which you can't. It's, it's, just a, it's, just, it's a matter of haystack, needles in haystacks. Very few actually will go on rampages. There are thousands and thousands who fit the profile. 
but they don't turn their angst into action. So absolutely, it tends to uh, encourage the, a, a, us to suspend a lot of those freedoms that we enjoy. We do it to ourselves. We do it, you know, in, in post 9-11, we, we inconvenience ourselves at airports tremendously. Uh, and I'm sure that there are many people out in the terrorism world who looks at what we do to ourselves and they love the fact that we take our shoes off and our belts off and all those other things because it's something that we wouldn't ordinarily want to do. And of course, we know we did uh, launch two wars and spend trillions of dollars after the uh, terror attack um, on 9-11. But this is a form of terrorism. And I think that uh, officials rightly think I, I can't be seen to be doing nothing. Uh, and so there are things that people are like trying to do uh, without having any real connection to, to making things better. Um, one of the things that uh, um, I, I just want to go back to the, the school issue just for a moment. Um, I, I spent some time doing some, some survey of, well, of your stuff, but, uh, but of many of the articles that have been written recently um, talking about are these, these active shooter drills traumatizing children. And uh, the consensus is certainly the ones that are these realistic ones are. And as a person who has been through active shooter training on my way to a war zone and who has held a hot AK-47, um, you know, I, I appreciated the training that I got. But it seems clear that surprising children and making them send texts to their parents to say goodbye, that is true trauma, to have to think that you're at the end of your life. Um, and and I, I found it interesting that the trainings are, uh, many of them, perhaps not all of them, but many of these realistic ones are, um, are uh, co commercial by a company called Alice that does about five, has 5,000 educational clients or more in this country, uh, they have a profit motive. So there are plenty of other government and private sector uh, and educational experts who recommend against this kind of training and advise bringing together uh, a group of, of stakeholders, child trauma experts, parents, staff, and, and educators to come up with appropriate, age appropriate and school appropriate trainings that aren't every month <laughs> and that aren't realistic. And I think you wanted to add. You don't have to have kids hide on the desk, hide in the corner, turn on the lights, lock the door. You can just tell them. You know, we do active, we, we've done drills here at Northeastern on Columbus Day when there are no classes and no students around involves the police, campus police, the Boston police, other administrators, some faculty. That's fine. They're the ones who should be trained. As far as schools, train the teachers, train the administrators, train the cops, leave the students out of it. See, I like it like it's a, an airplane. You get an airplane, there's a certain you know, probability of a crash or, or water landing, as they call it, and no one pays attention at the beginning of the flight when they're telling you what to do in the case of a water landing because we're so busy on our phones getting our last emails out. Unless you're on JetBlue, which is my son's airline, because you can get free Wi-Fi. Um, we, we trust that the crew has been trained, and they have. And if something bad's happened, what I'm going to do, I'm going to, hey, what, did you, what, did, what should I do now? You listen up if, something, if the need arises. Same thing on a cruise ship. I do lots of cruises, and the first, first day, uh, you go to your muster station. First time I did a cruise, I didn't know what a mustard station was. I thought we were going to get hot dogs with mustard and relish. But all you do is you put on your life jacket. They don't put you in the lifeboats. They don't put you down into the water. That would be very, very frightening and traumatizing. So basically for kids, tell them what to do. Don't make them go through these endless drills multiple times. Some schools do it every month. So uh, one of the things I wonder is whether there's uh, any evidence of a correlation uh, between mass shootings and the perceived level of fear in communities of color. I mean, are, is the way mass shootings has been presented in major media having an effect on schools where uh, neighborhoods may already encounter more violence? Um, and are all of these mass shooting drills for kids being held 
in those uh, schools serving kids of color as well as they are uh, being uh, put forward in primarily white suburban schools? I, I don't know of, of surveys that specifically break it down to that level, but I will tell you that, that many of these requirements about doing drills in schools are state laws that, that apply to all schools, no matter where they are located. Let me say one other thing about schools. Back in the 1990, late 1990s, we had more school shootings, more mass shooting schools than we have now. We had eight in five years. In fact, we had, we had four mass shootings in one academic year, 1997, 1998, Hillsborough, West Paducah, Pearl, and Springfield. And then in May of, uh, in uh, March of, of 2001, Dan Rather declared school shootings an epidemic. I remember very well that, in fact, I was on Bill Clinton's advisory committee on school shootings. There was tremendous concern about school shootings. The Department of Education sent around pamphlets to every school about how to spot the warning signs. But then, for five years, there wasn't another school shooting. You know why? Because 9-11 happened, and we stopped obsessing over school shootings. You see, we, there's contagion out there but the contagion is because we constantly talk about it. The presidential debates talk about mass shootings. And we obsess over it and we continue to fuel the contagion by continually keeping it in people's minds, including the ones who, who might want to pick up a gun and do that. I'm not saying we should put our heads in the sand, but it, we talk about it far too much, obsess over it far too much, that if we locate it a little bit more, Maybe the idea about going on a rampage just won't be so immediate on people's minds. Sure. Um, I don't have data or an analysis to say whether or not uh, those two things are definitely correlated. But I think it is an opportunity to illustrate the importance of focusing on issues which are salient uh, for communities where they are um, before addressing to these to some, ex some extent uh, manufactured. Uh, fears. So if, if the public discourse is focused on mass shootings um, that are by and large occurring in spaces that are, well, I, I don't know what the numbers are, but I don't think that there have been any um, high profile mass shootings in communities of color, um, with the exception of maybe the Pulse nightclub incident. And, uh, so when this happens and sort of there's, it, it provides a motive for more rigorous um, policing or more rigorous um, monitoring and surveillance. Um, it can heighten the already present and prevalent um, discrepancies in incarceration rates um, and hostile police encounters, not necessarily um, violent, but hostile um, in communities of color or, or black and brown communities, um, maybe even particularly in schools uh, where we already see a disproportionate rate of um, the tension and uh, sort of isolationist expulsion and, and other things um, for black students specifically, um, but for students of color more generally, um, and then also for black girls um, specifically, uh, for which the gap is higher between the, uh, the detention rates and the, the expulsion rates for between black girls and, and white girls than between um, black boys and, and white boys. Um, so I think that focusing on these things which are not as pervasive problems as they are can um, have the un unintended consequence um, of making already present issues worse. Yeah, uh, sir, I, I wanted to ask you, and you can follow up on this too, but could you also address, you said you, when you first started, you were looking at questions of going after corporations, maybe with lawsuits. And I wonder if you could talk a bit about that, because we know in the cigarette industry, for example, lawsuits were very effective in kind of controlling that industry from the capitalist perspective, right? We'll make it so expensive that you're going to come around. With the opioid epidemic, that's a strategy that seems to be embraced. There have been lawsuits now brought against gun uh, manufacturers. Is that something you explored or something you think could be another part of your strategy in addition to uh, the red flag laws? And uh, uh, I, I do know that uh, Professor Fox has a, a lot of experience with this as well. Um, in 2005? Yes, uh, 2005. Uh, Congress passed a law called PLACA. Its acronym is PLACA, which prevents 
the, uh, the, the, the suing of a, a gun manufacturer for injuries or death caused by a, a criminal act by a third party. There are some exceptions to that. Um, the important exception is something called the, the predicate statute exception, which has almost never been successfully used. Um, and the only time that I've been able to find where it's actually gone forward and it may be successful uh, is in the Soto case, which is the Sandy Hook parents brought a lawsuit under the predicate statute exception of PLACA against Bushmaster, the manufacturer of the assault weapon used in that shooting. And it has, uh, and it is the predicate statute, this exception, the idea is that if there was a violation by the manufacturer of a state or federal law, that allows that lawsuit to go forward. So in this particular case, the parents argue that the marketing of this assault weapon as in a military kind of way to a civilian um, uh, market uh, is a violation of the Connecticut Unfair Trade Practices Act. That argument uh, was uh, appealed all the way up to the, the Connecticut Supreme Court. That court accepted that this statute could be a predicate statute for the purposes of PLACA. Went back to the trial court, and I believe it is currently stayed while that is uh, appealed to the Supreme Court. So the, the, we don't know yet whether that will be successful and whether that will be the first case in which discovery will be permitted where the, the internal communications and marketing strategies and ideas that this particular company engaged in for the marketing of its product. And that is that is the basis of how these, these tobacco litigation cases got started. Active shooter drill. I agree with you about the law. Prior to 2005, I guess not. I guess we need to leave. All right. Thank you.